Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Today, we will announce the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. This prize is financed by the Central Bank of Sweden, awarded by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and included in the Nobel Prize ceremony. The first prize was awarded in 1969 to Ragnar Frisch and Jan Tinbergen, and it is now being awarded for the 50th time. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are celebrating an anniversary with half a century of economics prizes. My name is Jordan Hansson. I'm the Secretary General of the Academy. And with me here at the podium is, to my right, the Chairman of the Prize Committee, Professor Per Strömberg. And on my left, uh, Professor uh, Per Krusell, who is a member of the Prize Committee and who will tell us more about the research that's being awarded today. This year's prize is about innovation, climate and economic growth. Årets pris handlar om innovation, klimat och ekonomi i växelverkan. Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har idag beslutat att utdela Sveriges Riksbanks pris i ekonomisk vetenskap till Alfred Nobels minne för år 2018 med ena hälften till William D. Nordhaus för att ha integrerat klimatförändringar i långsiktig makroekonomisk analys. Och med andra hälften till Paul M. Romer för att ha integrerat teknisk utveckling i långsiktig makroekonomisk analys. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel for 2018, with one half to William D. Nordhaus for integrating climate change into long-run macroeconomic analysis, and the other half to Paul M. Romer for integrating technological innovations into long-run macroeconomic analysis. And you have now some biographical data um, about our new, no new laureates uh, above me, us here. Dr. William Nordhaus was born in Albuquerque in New Mexico in the United States in 1941 and is currently at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut in the US. Dr. Paul Romer was born in Denver, Colorado in the United States in 1955. He's currently working at uh, New York University School of Business and was previously the chief economist of the World Bank. And with that, I'd like to uh, turn over to Per Strömberg, the chairman of the prize committee, to give us some remarks about this year's prize. Thank you. Um, so, the causes and consequences of economic growth uh, is an issue of global importance and long-term implications, because just a few percent of growth can accumulate over decades, and when it does that, it radically changes people's lives. The growth of the economy is determined both by nature which provides the necessary resources for growth, and by the current state of knowledge, which determines how well we can manage these scarce resources that nature provides. But can we really rely on the market economy to keep on generating this new knowledge um, necessary for long-run sustained growth? And how should we deal with the negative effects of economic growth on nature, uh, for example, the climate change caused by increasing emission of greenhouse gases. This year's laureates have provided us with tools that are crucial for understanding how the economy interacts with nature and with knowledge, uh, and which policies help generate sustained and sustainable long-term economic growth. In the mid-1970s, as natural scientists started to become increasingly worried about the effects of greenhouse gas emissions on the climate, William Nordhaus started studying the interplay between the market economy and the global climate. About 10 years later, in the late 1980s, Paul Romer started to work on trying to formulate a new model of how technologies develop in the market economy. And the models that Nordhaus and Romer um, uh, created have significantly broadened the analysis of economic growth 
and I provided the standard framework for research and policy making in the areas of technological development and climate change. Thank you, Per. And now, Per Krusell, are you ready to give us some background about the research that's being awarded, please? Thank you. So this year's uh, laureate, uh, laureates, they have uh, made macroeconomics uh, go to a truly global scale and address long-run problems, truly long-run problems. And they ask uh, very sharp questions. Nordhaus asks, how should economies appropriately address climate change? Romer asks how economies can ensure a healthy rate of technological progress. These are questions that are of vital importance to human well-being. But it's easier to ask questions than to answer them, and they both realized that the frameworks for addressing the questions were actually missing in economics. So their task became to come up with frameworks so that you could ask the questions. In 1994, Nordhaus was done, uh, at least with his first complete integrated assessment model. It's a framework that describes the interplay between the climate and the economy. In 1990, Romer published a complete theory of what's called endogenous technical change, uh, which allows us to understand the economic roots of technological progress. So Nordhaus built a model that he called DICE, Dynamic Integrated Model of Climate and the Economy, <coughs> and it has three interdisciplinary parts, modules. One is the, econ the economy, Another one is the carbon cycle, and the third one is the climate. In the economic model, Nordhaus builds on traditional growth theory, but he adds uh, fossil fuel as an important uh, good for businesses and households. They use it for their energy needs, and this gives rise to carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions. Carbon dioxide uh, moves into the atmosphere and goes into carbon circulation among different reservoirs. That happens in the carbon cycle module. And finally, the climate module describes how the climate uh, is affected by the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. The climate also affects the economy by causing damages by global warming, and that's also described in the economic module. So now we have the pieces that are needed to do the analysis. And I'll show you um, an example of how DICE is put to use. This is a graph that shows us uh, what the model predicts for carbon dioxide emissions over time. In this, under the assumption that we don't change our current climate policies. Here's another graph. That's what comes about if you do a calculation that's similar to what governments do when they do cost-benefit analysis and think about pros and cons. That leads to a carbon tax, and that curbs emissions. The next one is also the same type of calculation, but where the government puts much higher weight on future generations, and you see that emissions fall even more. Finally, a similar path is arrived at if you set a maximum degree of warming to two and a half degrees. So these kinds of calculations and different generations of dice have been key input into the IPCC reports. Paul Romer, in the 1980s, puzzled over the following type of data. Here you see growth experiences of three countries. They're just examples, but they illustrate something important. Chad grew between 1960 and 1981 by minus 2% per year. Singapore grew by almost 8% plus 8% per year. And the Philippines were like in the middle, and they actually grew like the, the world as a whole. So you see huge income gaps opening up over the course of only two decades. This has staggering consequences for human welfare, and Romer concluded that likely technological growth was behind the long-run economic growth observed in these different countries. So he asked himself, what explains this technological growth in market economies? And the crux was to understand ideas, he thought, ideas for new technology. Where do they come from? And his vision was to build uh, a framework where ideas give rise to new ideas, which give rise to new ideas, propelling growth over time. 
So what kind of a product is an idea? He had to come up with a new way of thinking about goods and services. And I'll try to illustrate this here with a rectangle. And so he, <coughs> he thought of normal goods from the, the textbooks as rival goods. Here's an example of a nice uh, dish of Swedish meatballs. That would be a rival good. Uh, it's rival because when I eat the meatballs, nobody else can eat them. Not very deep. But uh, here's an idea. An idea is a non-rival good. This is the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, and when I use it, and people use it all over the world at the same time, I don't prevent anyone else from using it. They can use it for free. That's a very valuable idea. But it's not the kind of ideas that markets provide. Here's another idea. What is this? This is uh, computer code. But you can't really see that it's computer code. Why? Because it's encrypted. So there's a, a dimension of ideas, which is that can be excludable or non-excludable. The theorem cannot be excluded, uh, but a com computer co code can. And Romer realized that it's the excludable type of, types of goods that can be provided by markets. Here's something in between, somewhat excludable. This is the recipe for the Swedish meatballs. Uh, <laughs> it's in Swedish, so it's, it's uh, hard to understand for uh, most of the world's population. So he focused on this part of the rectangle. Ideas are non-rival. For market production, they need to be partly excludable. Restricting access is key, but it's also tricky because restricting access means that there will be monopoly power, and we know there are problems with monopoly power. So Romer incorporated this new par paradigm, this new way of thinking about goods and services into growth theory and built a simulation model, much like Nordhaus's DICE model. So <coughs> These two researchers, they have asked different questions. Uh, they have worked entirely separately. Uh, but they have many things in common. One is that they build on the same growth theory framework. They also ask questions of a truly global and long-run macroeconomic nature. They don't provide definitive answers. Why? Because these answers are, these, the questions are huge and very difficult to answer definitively. But they offer us the methodological tools to begin finding them uh, in the form of dynamic simulation models. They also offer us great advice in terms of thinking systematically about economic policy. So Nordhaus highlights uh, what economists call neg negative spillover effects. And here the idea is that when firms and when businesses and households use fossil fuel, they, they pay for the production of the fuel, but not for the damages they cause when they generate emissions. So he advocates a global carbon tax, and he shows us how, how, to, how to compute it. Romer highlights spillover effects too, but in this case they're positive. Here the idea is that when an innovator come up with, comes up with a new idea, uh, the innovator may make some profits, but doesn't fully uh, get to the benefits from how this idea helps other innovators. So this means that you may need R&D subsidies on top of a carefully designed patent system. The impact clearly of the research of, these, um, of this year's laureates uh, has been enormous. It's had huge amounts, it led to huge amounts of subsequent research. And in the policy sphere, it's had uh, immense practical relevance for global macroeconomic policymaking. Thank you very much, Per, for that excellent presentation. And now we may have one of our new, new laureates with us on the phone line. Dr. Romer, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, good morning. Good morning. This is Jaron Hansen, who spoke with you about half an hour ago and gave you the good news. We're having a yes, press conference thanks. now here at the Royal Academy of Sciences, and we have number of journalists here, and I'm sure some of them would like to ask you some questions. Yes, the, we have a gentleman over <laughs> here who would like to start. I think he's from Swedish television. Please. Okay. Congratulations, Mr. Romer, to the prize. Yes, thank you. This is Knut Kajnsson, dude, for Swedish television in Stockholm. Uh, I must ask you, you wrote a paper a couple of years ago in New York when you were very critical against your colleagues on the current state of national economics. Um, 
What do you think about those thoughts today? Well, the, in some sense, what both Bill Nordhaus and I have been thinking about is the, the process of science. It's what the Nobel Prizes recognize, many of them, several of them. And um, science is the most important social system humans have ever developed. But part of how science works is by uh, criticism and challenge. Um, there's no authority who can shut things down. There's no Supreme Court. Different individual scientists say what they think is, is right, and when they think their colleagues are wrong, they, they will say that. And so by criticizing over some dimensions where I thought there were some weaknesses, I was really just trying to do the thing that has always been part of the, the scientific method. May I just ask you, is, is there still a f uh, fog of math, uh, as you called it, in this science? Um, I'm sorry, is it still? Uh, this, oh, uh, yes. Yeah, fog of math. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a subtle issue because math is a language, just like, you know, Swedish and English are languages. Math is very good for producing results like and explaining results like the Pythagorean theorem uh, that Per mentioned. Um, so math can be used very productively in a very helpful way. But sometimes uh, people use it in a way which creates a, a kind of a fog of misunderstanding. And part of what uh, I was pushing for, and I think I, you know, everyone needs to keep pushing for, is that we all try as hard as we can to communicate, communicate clearly. Because this is part of what Pear's presentation brings out, is that knowledge is valuable only if it's communicated to other people. And it won't be accurately communicated if people are vague or confusing in their communication. So is there still some fog in our science? Of course. There's fog in our communication on everything. There's always room to do better, and uh, it's part of my job is to help, help push that we all do better. Thank you very much. Now we have a question from Associated Press. Hello. First of all, congratulations, uh, sir, on the prize. Debbie Keaton from the Associated Press. Now, this prize comes at a very timely moment. The IPCC released a report today uh, with uh, major climate scientists saying that the world has only a dozen years uh, to prevent uh, global warming past the 1.5 degrees, uh, unless uh, which could uh, then, um, if it's not secede, uh, yield to serious risks of drought, flooding, extreme heat, and other uh, environmental crises. To what extent can this prize highlight not just the environmental risk, but also the economic risk to the planet if the world is not able to uh, find an effective solution to combat climate change? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so first, let me say that um, it's, it's a shame that Bill isn't on the call because, you know, he'd be best positioned to speak to this. I also want to be clear that the, the economics that I was struggling with about ideas um, were it was this was a case where I could draw on work that Bill had done about monopolies and patents and ideas in his own PhD thesis. So there's a direct connection between my work and Bill's earlier work. I, I, I can't speak for him, but I think he would agree with me on the following point. It, it's entirely possible for humans to produce less carbon. There's some trade-offs, but once we start to try and reduce carbon emissions, we'll be surprised that it wasn't as hard as we uh, anticipated. I, I read a little bit about the concern people had when we addressed the problem of the ozone hole caused by chlorofluorocarbons. 
there were many people saying this would be enormously expensive and difficult. And, uh, and then once we actually set about reducing emissions of chlorofluorocarbons, it, it was a non-event. It, so I think the danger with the very alarmist portraits that people are giving, uh, for which there's real basis, is that it will make people feel apathetic and hopeless. Um, it's entirely doable for us, even now, to start bringing down the path of emissions and to protect a better future in climate. And it's entirely possible for us to have better standards of living um, uh, as far into the future as we we can see. So um, I, I said I was uh, once a, a conditional optimist. If we do the right thing, everything can keep going better, but uh, it is time that we start doing the right thing. Thank you very much for those thoughtful words. We have a question, the gentleman over there. Dr. Rummer, congratulations. My name is Johan Schick from Longest New Theater in Stockholm. Um, I know that you have put forward uh, rather controversial and bold ideas concerning how to deal with global migration. And that was some years ago. How do you look upon this issue now? Um, I, I want to borrow a phrase that's attributed to Winston Churchill. I don't know if he said it. But uh, my suggestion for dealing with m potential migration flows is the worst idea that's ever been proposed, except for all the others. <laughs> The problem is, is that there are no perfect solutions to uh, a problem with enormous human consequences. And what I was trying to do was encourage people to think about some possibilities that um, weren't perfect. There's no question they wouldn't be perfect, but they would be better than what we have now, and uh, I think better than any of the alternatives that uh, that others have suggested. So as, as I think people have come to realize we don't have good alternatives, and as they've realized the scale, there are hundreds of millions of people who say they want to leave the country where they were born. Um, I, I think that you, this may be a time where we also start to think a little bit about um, what could we do to give people who are desperate to be safe, desperate to have a job, desperate for their children to have a future, what could we do to make it possible for them to, uh, uh, to pursue those, uh, those goals, the things that we all pursue? Thank you very much. Now, we have time for one or two more questions. Was it, who was next? The, the lady over there, please. Congratulations. I'm Sufitian Aksasong from Green Post and China Radio. I ask a, a simple question. Uh, how uh, Have you uh, expected uh, that you win the prize? What was your reaction when you heard this news? Thank you. Well, I, I, got, I, didn't, I got called, I got two phone calls this morning and I didn't answer either one because I thought it was some spam call. So uh, I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't expecting it, the, the prize. But finally, we uh, were able to establish contact, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> before the press conference. Yes, the gentleman <laughs> over there. <laughs> uh, Hans Palmgren, Swedish TV4. Congratulations from me as well. Uh, in what way do you think the prize can contribute uh, to focus on the climate questions? Um, I'm, I'm going to make a conjecture about politics, which isn't my direct uh, area of expertise. But my sense is that optimism is, um, is part of what helps motivate people to attack a hard problem. And um, I think one of the problems um, with 
the current situation is that many people think that dealing with uh, the, the, protecting the environment will be so costly and so hard that they just want to ignore the problem. They want to deny it exists. They can't deal with it. I hope the prize today could help everyone see that humans are capable of amazing accomplishments when we set about trying to do something. And if we all, if we set about making the policy changes that are uh, required here, um, we can absolutely uh, make substantial progress towards protecting um, the environment and do it without, uh, uh, without giving up the chance to sustain growth. So I hope uh, that the, the optimism will help us shift over into taking the steps uh, that we really need to take. Thank you very much, Dr. Romer. And uh, there will be more opportunities to ask Dr. Romer questions uh, and hear his views on these important issues uh, in December. Uh, but, so we look forward to meeting you in December, Dr. Romer. And until then, thanks for being with us today and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. And now, questions to the panel. Is everything crystal clear? Yes, there is a question over there, the lady over there. Thank you. And this is Dongyang uh, from Nordic Chinese Times. And we could see that both awards are given to the people who are trying to tackle um, global macroeconomic issues. So I wonder that um, how the price will relate to the fluctuating um, global economy, especially in terms of um, trade protectionism and uh, political uncertainty. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I don't honestly don't think there is a strong tie between the price and, and the areas that you brought up. They are important areas, but they are not really. They don't have much overlap with uh, with this year's price. So, how do you think that the price will uh, improve the efficiency in emerging markets? I don't think it speaks to that very much. I mean, the, what 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 uh, what the price talks about to some extent is is uh, the importance of knowledge growth and technology growth, but it's not very specific. So obviously, emerging markets benefit uh, enormously from the technology uh, revolutions that the leading te technology countries go through because because they can ride on the wave of technology that innovators in mostly you know the rich countries today uh, contribute so in that sense but i don't think it's it's not a topic that we focus much on in this particular price formulation it, Pastor, yeah if i can add to that uh, both of these prices are really about global problems that you know the whole world needs to get together to solve how to get the right amount uh, of technological progress, how to solve the global problem of climate change. And I guess if there's a message that's relevant here, it's that we, we need to get together, okay, to, to get a global solution. And to get a global solution, we also need to realize, you know, rich countries need to realize the problems that uh, emerging markets have with implementing some of these solutions, you know, how in, when it comes to patent protection, when it comes to uh, uh, emissions and so on. So I guess the message is that, you know, it's needed for countries to cooperate globally to solve some of these big questions. Okay. So, okay, one last question. You are shaking again. Uh, thank you. Uh, both these uh, uh, winners of the prize have been expected for uh, quite a long time, but not that they will get it, the prize together. And, uh, uh, well, one interpretation could be that some uh, people in the press committee are fond of climate and others are fond of growth, and then you have made a compromise. But another is that there is, uh, is something really connecting these two uh, great economists. But could you tell uh, w what is then 
uh, the link between the two uh, a bit more than you have already told us. So, okay. Yeah, so, the, so it's, uh, it's not the first interpretation, for sure. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I can also tell you that when Paul Romer received uh, the call, he was uh, super happy that it was also given to Nordhaus. I mean, he's clearly interested in Nordhaus's work. They're interested in each other's work, and I think it's because they are part, uh, they're part of the same agenda uh, to think about the long run and, and to think about global issues. Um, so, and they're, they're asking fundamental questions, extremely difficult questions. Uh, so they, they have these things in common, but they also have in common that they built these tools that, that are very much alike. They built simulation tools that the rest of us can use and look at and study and improve. And um, so I, I think it's, it's this common base that they built. That's another thing in common. Uh, they have a similar view of how to think about economic policy as well. As I em emphasized in the presentation, they both think in terms of market failures, but they're kind of different in nature, but it's the same type of recipe uh, that they offer. Uh, so, I, so I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of things in common, and, and, and in fact, there is uh, new literature coming out that, that I think Paul, was, was, uh, Paul Romer was uh, referring to, which is that to address some of the climate change issues, you really need to think about new technologies that replace fossil fuel. Maybe new technologies that can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There's a range of technology solutions. I think without these technology solutions, uh, it's going to be very hard. I think that was implicit in what, what Paul Romer said. So how can we think about those things without having Romer's shoulders to stand on. Uh, so I think there's a lot of connections. I think it's only superficially that they look different. Thank you. And I think with that, we'll close this press conference. And now there will be opportunities for individual interviews. So thank you very much for your interest. And welcome back in December or next year. Thank you.